Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mathieu Desnoyers, I am CEO at Efficios. Uh, so I maintain quite a few things now. Uh, restartable sequences system call in Linux, um, the MemBarrier system call in Linux, uh, the uh, part of the LTTNG project uh, for kernel and user space tracing, as well as, as, well as the user space RCU library. Um, and now I want to specifically discuss with you uh, how we can improve the GNU C library with restartable sequences. So in a nutshell, what is restartable sequence? Uh, it's a system call in Linux. It, it allows, uh, for instance, libc to register a per thread area at C startup and at p thread creation. And that then allows user space to create small sequences of code, which you could see as transaction, uh, that are managed by the kernel. Uh, so in those small transactions, few instructions can do fast access to per CPU data in user space. Uh, so uh, it's currently used uh, since uh, the GNU C library 2.35, which integrated support for restartable sequence, and it's used in the implementation of SCED get CPU, especially to speed up uh, architectures like uh, ARC64, which do not provide a VDSO for getting the current CPU number. So we actually have the kernel always keeping up to date the current CPU number in this per thread area. So we just load it. That's very, very fast. So there are many general use cases uh, that can apply to uh, RSEC, such as uh, resource allocation, memory allocation, uh, ring buffers, I, use, I want to use that for tracing, uh, counters, uh, I have counter libraries, a part of my tracer which can really benefit from this uh, using split counter schemes, and as well for synchronization. So the adoption status of restartable sequence, uh, so in the Linux kernel, the architectures that are implemented and for which there are tests implemented, uh, we have, uh, so all of those are both 32 and 64-bit supported. So ARM, MIPS, Power, RISC-V, S390, XCD6. So uh, there, I've seen that CSKY and LongArc have the RSEC, AVRSEC, thing enabled, and they do have the, the, the code in the signal handler, although I, I spotted an issue on, uh, on CSKY that has been fixed by the maintainer, but they never implemented the test. So the architecture specific header code that go along with the kernel self-test. So this is untested on those architectures. I don't, I, I don't like that. I've asked the CSKY maintainer uh, to either provide test or revert the support for RSEC on his architecture. I prefer to have an architecture not supporting RSEC than having it supporting, claiming to support it without test. And for long arc, well, I mean, it's their decision, but I don't quite like it. So on the GNU C library uh, side, it's been used since JLibc 2.35. Uh, as I said, used to implement get, get CPU. Uh, and I want to discuss other use cases. Uh, it's used by Google's TC malloc now. Um, the CRIU, the Checkpoint Restore project, supports RSEC, uh, so they can save the state and restore it, uh, the, the needed state. Dynamo Rio, I think they disabled it though. I mean, they, 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 they looked into supporting it and everything. Oh no, no, actually they do the execute twice approach. Yes, yes, so they support it. So they execute it once without the side effect, and then they re-execute it all at once with the side effect. So because usually those small sequence of code, you have many instructions without side effect, and then it ends with a commit instruction, which has the only side effect of the critical section. So you are, you're either aborted before you reach the end, or you do it completely. Uh, so uh, there's been uh, various seccomp allo lists that were that needed to add the restartable sequence support. Uh, so that came uh, that became clear when the, the GNU C library started using it. So that's good. It, it paves the way. Um, so and I, I do develop a libersec, which is mainly mainly a set of header files that implement the most common, let's say, primitive operation someone might need. Things like a, a compare and exchange and things like that. Uh, so we need to implement uh, inline assembly code for every architecture that we support. So I think uh, libersec currently supports something like six, seven architectures. But yeah, it's a big list of uh, inline S ASM. Um, so now, more to the point of this presentation and discussion, uh, here are the use cases uh, that I pinpoint that are ahead of, are ahead of us uh, for the GNU C library. 
So one is uh, using it for a get CPU. So the get CPU, um, um, uh, well, I mean, part of it is a syscall, and I think the libc exposes an, uh, an API for it, uh, a symbol. So there's uh, the last parameter that the tcache pointer is documented as being unused. Uh, so the first two is what we care about. The CPU number, we have it very quickly from the, the RSEC structure, the per thread structure. The node ID is something I want to add to the struct RSEC. So that get CPU could be implemente implemented purely in user space uh, from a glibc perspective. So uh, one thing that's kind of important is that we want to load both of those values with a kind of RSEC load U32, U32, so that within a RSEC critical section that will complete atomically from the point of view of the scheduler and migration, we, lead, we load both fields so that the, the, the mapping between that pair of values stays invariant for the whole lifetime of the process after that unless there is, let's say, a new topology reconfiguration on architectures like uh, PowerPC. They, they may do that on CPU Outlook, but this is really something that is atypical. So, um, extending the RSEC structure, I just want to make sure, one second, that I have all the content. Yeah, okay, it's not so bad. Let's have a look. Sorry about that, I just changed the slide size, so I want to make sure that everyone sees. Okay, there we go. This might happen a few times. Uh, it, I was in 4-3 four, four ratio, uh, and then I just changed it, so uh, let's have a look. Extending, yeah, there we go. Okay, extending struct RSEC. Um, I want to make the RSEC ABI extensible. Uh, currently, it's just a few fields uh, and padding at the end important point there. Um, so how I plan to do it is to use the ELF auxiliary vectors, and this is actually an idea from uh, Florian. Uh, so uh, I want the kernel to let user space know about the supported feature size. And this is not really the same thing about, uh, as the size of the RSEC structure, because the current size of the RSEC structure is includes padding at the end. We really want to know how many of, of, uh, how many of the fields are actually semantically implemented by the kernel. And those padding fields at the end of struct RSEC, I, I want to make use of those. I mean, this is prime real estate, right? This is cache hot, cache lines uh, that, that I want to make uh, the, the best use out of. So I don't want to leave that as, as padding. It makes no sense. So, um, yeah, so uh, the idea there is to have the GNUC library, so the original RSEC size was 32 bytes, uh, so GNUC library could either register that size or a larger size that would be large enough to accommodate the, the, the supported feature size expressed by the kernel. And then the GNUC library could expose two applications because currently uh, there's an RSEC size symbol exposed by the GNUC library to applications. But the thing is, I mean, currently it, it, it says, well, okay, 32 byte is a size, but it has no meaning in terms of feature set that is supported. So this is where I would like to add a new RSEC feature size symbol. I mean, having thought about this extensibility scheme well enough ahead of time, that would, I mean, the RSEC size would have been the feature size. So, Florian just raised his hand online, and um, I'm kind of watching the online Zoom as well, because I think the one thing we've probably left out in each of these rooms is that you need a, we actually need a watcher for each room to watch the online Zoom stuff to see that if people have their hands raised. Um, Florian writes, we already have our sec flags. The kernel could tell us to register with extra flag bits, then we can use the padding. So. I'll have to think more about it. Uh, yeah, but okay. maybe, yeah. It's because we, we already have our sec flags in, in glibc. So I guess the point is, you know, the kernel through whatever uh, AT flag coming down or something coming down could tell us to register with the extra flag bits and then then we can know something. Oh, you mean, okay. So f from a glibc ABI perspective, when we are using the RSEC size as a feature set, then there would be a RSEC flag raised in the RSEC flag uh, uh, symbol. I guess that's a possibility. Yeah. Oh, Hold question. On. Michael. Uh, 
I don't know about the specific, uh, what, what, what Florian said, but in any case, I want to raise the general thing that it should not be a data symbol, it should be a function returning something, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the size of something should not imply any features. If you want to enumerate features, define maybe a bit. <laughs> no, no, no. It, okay, in this specific case, uh, I've had this, this discussion many times with many people. In this specific case, this structure is ABI in users, well, between the kernel yes. and user space, but my, also my, my within point user is, space. My point is the size is not the ABI, the contents of the structure are the ABI. Yes, then if, you, if you want switch, to... If you switch to fields, the size No, you is. cannot. You can yeah. never do that, and once they are implemented, yeah, they need to stay there should, and unchanged. That's why you should add a bit no, you cannot. It's, it's this version or no, that version. No, no, it cannot. Because within well, one, can. one second, within one process, that structure is shared between glibc application and various shared objects. Yeah. They all need to agree on the content, which means the layout may never change. It becomes something else. But it's not a version. It's not bits saying it's enabled or uh, disabled. It's there. It's going to grow. But it can never either change or once a feature is there, in order to have the following features, you, you need to implement the prior ones. Yeah, I understand. But, that, but the point is that you can't protect against this with just the size. You need to know more about that. So it, it, The size works for that. <laughs> not really, no. Uh, because if, it, if, it, if you have an, I don't know, let's say a random shared library that allocates the RSEC sequence statically, right? And, dot ro data, then something needs to make sure that this was not too small in the actual runtime when it's Wait, 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 wait. So, uh, so struct rsec is a communication channel between the kernel and applications and libraries, but it's owned by glibc. And it's allocated by glibc uh, in its own uh, struct pre-tread or, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. uh, the, the, the TCB, near the TCB, yes. Okay, okay. So it's not owned by applications. What the applications own are small descriptors of their critical sections, which describe, let's say, the abort IP, the beginning and the end, tiny, tiny. And then when they start a critical section, they store a pointer to this small descriptor in the uh, thread locals, okay. in, in well, the per-thread area. If everything is owned by glibc, why do the, I don't know, what what is actually supposed to check the feature size symbol then? If, Sorry? You know, if everything is owned by glibc, why would there be a need to export the feature size? Because the feature size in, is an agreement between the, what the kernel supports and what applications and libraries can use. glibc does not have to be in the way. The only thing that glibc needs to do is to allocate a size that is large enough to hold all those fields. That's it. It has okay, no. But, but you're saying that is done by glibc, right? Yes. Okay, so why does it need to export any information of that to any library or other libraries or executables? Because they want to know what features it has. Yep. Well, okay. If they want to know features, I'm again saying that maybe that the size is not a good representation of, you know, giving you the set of features. <laughs> but it should then be some, you know, more... Yeah, but, I mean, it, it is a, a feature set that needs to only grow. I mean, if, if you start wanting to peek all in that and say, oh, this one is not implemented, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a struct RSEC2. It's not the same. It's, it's a new ABI. It's new symbols. It's a new thing. Yeah, well, um, in any case, I, I raised my concern, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover, so but we can discuss offline uh, during the weekend. I, uh, I, I'm here; I'll be happy to discuss it more. Uh, okay, so idea about using flag for size. Okay, yes. Um, now, okay, sorry, I'll have to. I just hope I don't have to do that for every slide. All right. Yeah, okay, memory allocator use case. So uh, one problem with the per CPU arenas is that they do not perform better than a global or per thread arena in all cases. Uh, for instance, uh, you waste memory if your number of threads uh, is lower uh, than the 
number of cores. Uh, let's say you have a single threaded process. I mean, you'd be good with a single arena if you're per thread, so why allocate arenas for every core on the system? And that becomes especially painful if you take a system on which you apply CPU sets and then kind of uh, partition your system in smaller subsystems. But I mean, each of those uh, container can see the the whole number of CPU on your system, right? That's unfortunate. So, I mean, one thing you, that can be done is to use rather complex heuristics to figure out, okay, so uh, is it, uh, do I need to do arenas per thread? Do I need to go for a per core approach? Or do I need to have a global arena? So, uh, but I mean, cases where such complexity is unwanted might be real-time systems where memory and arenas should be, uh, I mean, they would like to be able to pre-fault everything, right? But if you start doing things per thread, then, I mean, new threads can come up and everything. So it's ra rather hard to, uh, to do that. So what I'm, what I did present earlier this week at Linux Plumber Conference is a scheme that uh, uses the scheduler knowledge of the amount of concurrency within a process to allocate virtual CPU IDs. So, uh, and, and the ger general problem that this solves is the need to configure user space data structure partitioning based on uh, being global per thread or per core based on the ratio of threads versus, versus cores uh, in, the, in the process. So that's the link to the presentation. Uh, it, Quickly, uh, so the original, uh, original idea comes from Paul Turner. Uh, we discussed it in uh, 2015, uh, 2019 at the Linux Plumbers Conference. And uh, the idea is to allocate virtual CPU ID within a process, uh, which can be uh, limited by the, no uh, bound by the number of threads that run concurrently. And the scheduler knows that, the Linux scheduler. Uh, so the Google implementation was not made publicly available, so I did my own implementation. Uh, and from the user space point of view, it adds a new field to our sec, which is a VM vCPU ID field. So you'll have, so you, as you're running, you run on a, uh, a given CPU number. Let's say you have the node ID now, and then you have this VM vCPU ID number. So the, the nice thing about it is if you're a single threaded process, that value is going to be pretty much always zero, right? Uh, if you are, even if you're a multi-threaded process, if you run, let's say, uh, in a container that has a CPU set of five CPU, it's never going to go be, uh, be uh, beyond five. So it, it keeps things nice and small. And, but it keeps enough entries so that you, each of the threads that run have their own bucket, their own entry. So they can do per CPU data, but I mean, it does not need to be the actual core index on the whole system. It can be limited. So uh, that's an example. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about memory allocator, arenas. So the idea I have, and this is something I discussed earlier this year uh, with Carlos, um, something I'd like to see happening is to have the memory allocator arenas for glibc uh, be based on the memory hierarchy. So the idea I have in mind is that there could be one arena to allocate from per virtual CPU. Then there could also be one arena at the NUMA node level and maybe one global. And then what can be done, and this is just a rough sketch of what the API could look like, but a thread could state, okay, I want now to allocate from the per node arena. I want to allocate now from the per vCPU arena or the global one. So it could tune from which pool memory should be allocated. So there, when you have workloads where uh, some pattern, uh, workload patterns where you have one thread doing all the allocation, a different thread doing all the free. So, I mean, it's kind of useless to allocate from a per v a vCPU uh, arena. So they might want to specify, I want to allocate from the per node arena instead. So everything, I mean, we know we're going to hit that same per node arena, but at least we're not going to be playing in each other's by backyard. So the, um, Virtual CPU, uh, yeah, okay. That's another thing that would be interesting. Um, so rather than saying, okay, each time I want to define a per CPU data, let's make a big array of data or an array of pointer that, that is indexed by virtual CPU ID. 
So it, if, if you do an array of actual data, uh, and that data is, is relatively small, you'll want to put some, some additional padding to eliminate false sharing. So that's wasted space, that's wasted cache lines. So one thing uh, that we could do is to flip things around and basically have a dedicated memory allocator mode that could allocate per CPU data. So let's say I want to allocate a 20-byte object. It would allocate 20-byte objects into each of the per vCPU arenas and then basically at the same offset within the arenas. So then we just have to figure out a way to do the offset calculation ef efficiently, uh, and then we could have per, uh, per vCPU data accesses. So I think that could be quite nice to keep things really packed in terms of memory allocation and don't waste, sp waste space uh, for, um, uh, for, for, uh, due, for padding to eliminate false uh, sharing. Uh, and I mean, that's a concept they use in the Linux kernel, so why not do that, uh, do something similar in user space? Um, another thing that would be nice, uh, or that can be done actually with, uh, with RSEC, is uh, doing statistics counter. So now I'm in the use case I want to bring where I think there may be uh, benefits for, for Jalipsy. So it's up to, if, up to you guys to tell me whether there are actual benefits or not. Um, so rather than using global counters when you want to do some resource accounting, using per virtual CPU ID counters scales much more nicely because you're not hitting a global cache line on, on multi-core systems. Uh, so the, the performance is similar to per thread counters, but the aggregation is much faster, especially, I, I mean, if you run thousands of threads, if you want to aggregate those per thread counters, you have to walk over many of those threads every time you want to aggregate. But with the per vCPU approach, then you're, you're bound by the, well, worst case it will be the number of cores on your system, but it, if you're a fine, fine to fewer cores, then it's even less. So uh, uh, it, it's a way to have fast and cheap counters. So having those counters much cheaper may make them more useful. So maybe, I mean, it does not become only, let's say, a, a, a debugging thing that's only enabled with tunables. I mean, it could be run onto real workload and be used for uh, uh, feedback-based uh, uh, tuning of, of the algorithms for each application or things like that. So it, it opens door to various things. So um, I, I plan to use this eventually also in user space RCU. Um, so Currently, the flavors of RCU that are implemented in the library are ba the, the grace period tracking is, is per thread. But I have prototype branches where the grace period tracking is done uh, per CPU. So with the virtual CPU IDs, then the per CPU becomes even cheaper. Um, and uh, by using RSEC as well, then I can skip atomic increments on the, when I, so, so basically I use atomic increments to, to signify the, re, the read side begin and end. Using RSEC, it can be made much fast, faster than atomics. I use the memory system call, uh, which is done by the grace period, which can then in turn, in, in turn eliminate memory barriers on the read side, and I can replace them by compiler barriers. So all the building blocks are now there uh, to have something that is fast uh, in terms of synchronization for RCU. And I, I know that Carlos at some point might be interested to implement RCU in uh, Libc to speed up many use cases that currently rely on reader-writer locks, but that would be made much faster, uh, faster and scale much better with RCU. So um, there's one thing that's nice to do per CPU grace period tracker, tracking rather than per thread is that with the per CPU uh, GP tracking, then you can allocate multiple RCU domains. So you're not stuck at having, let's say, one single linked list of thread that you iterate on and then if you, so as you do a synchronized RCU, it only interacts with, with, with your own domain if you are, are multi-domain RCU. Uh, if you're single domain RCU, there are cases where interaction between mutexes, RCU, and a synchronized RCU, so if you take a mutex within a read side, you could trigger deadlocks. 
So by splitting things into multiple domains, then you eliminate some chances of dead deadlocks. So that, that's a nice thing about multi-domain RCU. And then the color CU callbacks actually could be enqueued into per vCPU list rather than per CPU. Uh, so that's also a nice thing uh, that can be done. Other things um, that can be done with, uh, with RSEC. So having a, so the node ID, if you have a fast access to the node ID through RSEC, then you could use it very cheaply to say, well, rather than having every thread on every NUMA node trying to hit the same cache line to get a mutex, then you could have a first level where they basically agree together with a ticket per NUMA node, okay, who's going to be the next to try to take the resource and then do that hierarchically. And then, so one win, one wins, and then each NUMA node is going to try to take the resource. And then, so, so rather than having every thread on the system trying to hit that same shared uh, cache line across the entire system, you could start by NUMA node and having one elected representative going to the, the, the shared resource at the time. Another thing that could be done, and this is further extensions I have in mind, which I have not done yet, but it would be to do fast signal blocking. So rather than doing p thread sig, uh, sig, sig mask uh, set and things like that, uh, to block signals, what could be done here is to let the kernel know that the signals need to be blocked for a short critical section by just storing to this RSEC, uh, to this RSEC area in the, thread local, well, in, the, in the per thread area. So user space would just set the mask of signal that need to be blocked when entering the critical section. Then at the end, so it would clear the, the blocked mask. Then, the, so there would be another mask which be, would be set by the kernel read by user space. It would be a signal pending mask. So the kernel, while the critical section was executing, if it attempted to deliver a signal but noticed that they were blocked, then it would set the signal pending mask. Therefore, when user space exits the critical section, it should check the signal pending mask, and then if, it's, if something is set, it should call a kernel system call, and perhaps a new system call there, to say, please deliver all signals now. And we could probably piggyback on some existing system call as well to do that. So another thing I noticed, um, so the stack cache in glibc. Uh, so this is, as far as I understand, so glibc, when you exit the thread, so it, it does not let the memory go back to the kernel, especially for the, the, the stack, right? Which includes space for your stack and for your thread local storage mostly and the process descriptor. So it's keeping that around because, I mean, it's, it's nice, nicely laid out, it's, uh, it's cache hot, uh, it's, uh, it's everything. So it can be reused by an upcoming thread. So that stack cache is a global resource per process. It's protected by a, stack, a DL stack cache lock well, I mean, but it's just a cache, so we could make it per virtual CPU, so all the accesses would be local, would be extremely fast, and we'd el eliminate a global lock. So that, that's the kind of thing we can do with the per virtual CPU uh, IDs. So I have some references, but yeah, I mean, if, if you have question, uh, I'm, uh, I'm listening. And we have plenty of time. Yes, microphone. So is that a checkpoint restore issue that there was some checkpoint rest issue with checkpoint restore, is that resolved now? Yes, it is. So they've added a, a getter in the ptrace system call to get the RSEC state from within the kernel so that they can then restore it. Yes, that, that, that part that was missing, it's been contributed. I guess in your suggestion about glibc memory allocation malloc and distributing, there's recent discussion and even more so about tiered memory in Linux kernel stuff at the, the last Linux file system memory management conference. So it's funny, are you 
is there a way to utilize, or were you suggesting using restartable sequences specifically with the kernel to be able to communicate the tiered memory plans that are already in the Linux kernel and apply that to glibc, or are you just defining a completely parallel implementation of tiered memory, of, of pooled memory node specific NUMA hierarchy memory separate from the, what the kernel is planning? So, I mean, I cannot say I can fully answer your question uh, because I, I was not present in those presentations of that track. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but I mean, the, the core idea there is to allow user space to make the best choices in terms of uh, closeness of the memory allocation. Yeah based on its own need, and that's user space that know it, right? And, and it's even the application that knows it. Uh, hence the, the API to set, okay, do you want to allocate per, at, in the vCPU arena, in the, in the NUMA arena, or the global one? So that's the intent there. Uh, and uh, and my, my other intent is to, yeah. But I mean, in terms of tiered memory, I may need a very tiny refresher before I, I can fully answer your question uh, without uh, being too vague. No, 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 I, I understand. Thank, thanks very much. I mean, but I, I, mean, I guess what I, I mean, probably what I'm saying is I'm not certain how much um, the user, I mean, I cl clearly understand for the case where the user does know or has specific information about the Numa nodes, but there are cases that it might not, but the kernel does because of all this other tiered memory work that's doing. And so I'm just curious whether these restart okay. sequences can somehow communicate that separately to glibc that it can utilize better allocation of, of its memory. Actually, that touches a thought I had this morning when I prepared the slides. So if, so, so, if, in, so, in some rare cases, the user space might be, a, so a thread might be interested to say, I want the memory to be allocated for a, from a specific arena. And that might come from a specific set of hardware memory. So maybe this is what you have in mind in terms of tiered memory, right? So, so it might not be from the current NUMA node allocation. I mean, it might be something completely separate. It might be uh, persistent memory. It might be other things. Yeah, I mean, CXL, I mean, all these tiers. Yeah. That they yeah. So, so here, I mean, it might, might make sense to, in addition, so, and this is, let's go back to this, uh, this slide, the set thread malloc arena. So I made it simple, right? It's a small enum, but it could be an attribute descriptor that can contain the enum about, oh, please use the current vCPU arena or node or whatever, but it could also be overridden to say, please use, well, so it could come with an API that says, I want to create my own arena. Please put it right there in memory. Ask the kernel for a M map, and th this is where it goes, right? Some information about it hand that over to glibc, and then it could be passed as an argument, please, for the next allocations, I want to allocate from that arena. I don't know if it answers your... Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. I, 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 that, that's, yeah, exactly. That, that, that's part of it. I mean, I guess what I'm asking is specifically in your, you know, talk about restorable sequences, does restorable sequences specifically give you better information about that or provide a communication mechanism from the kernel f to implement that? It's almost... I'm trying to tie these together. Yeah, not really. And this is why I did not put that in my slides, because that's kind of an orthogonal problem. But it kind of makes sense. But it, 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 yeah, it's not related to the vCPU node or global or the hierarchy. It, 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 it is something that should be, I think, something that the user could override and say, oh, yeah, please allocate from there. Okay, thanks. Welcome. I was going to say that. Um, you know, the, the tiered hierarchy, there was a talk there, but I missed it. I didn't get a chance to watch that. I was watching a different talk. But I think per, as long as you can express that as per vCPU data, then restartable sequences can get it to the allocator quickly, and then the allocator can make decisions on the data that it sees when it's in that CPU. Um, the, like, uh, PMEM to DRAM hot page balancing, if we already know what node we're on and we're already getting local memory, then there's never going to be wasted work doing balancing for that thread as long as you pin that thread. And if you have multiple threads in producer-consumer model, who cares? You pin them all to that CPU and you're getting node local memory, then hopefully that, the balancer never has to do anything to move those pages, right? Because that's an expensive operation. Yeah, so, I mean, that, that, that brings an interesting point. How do you combine tiered memory and v, per vCPU indexing? Um, I, but I mean, like, if you can individually request that tiered memory, 
the API becomes really different. Um, Intel has a NUMA where allocator built on top of JMALloc, and that allocator is in, uh, in alpha, and like, I, I don't think it's, yeah, I think their docs say it's not intended for production uses. It could have changed the last time I looked at, that's what it said. Um, but the APIs become very different if you're trying to allocate like yeah. t tiers and classes of memory. I think J. Malloc has a concept of, you know, uh, kinds of memory. And the, so this allocator is called memkind, I think, which is the Intel-based allocator, which you can ask for kinds of things. Yeah. By the way, I mean, one thing I did not state is that the way I designed the, the, the virtual CPU IDs and the NUMA node IDs, I made sure that the mapping between the vCPU ID and the node ID stays invariant for the lifetime of the process, unless, of course, there's a kernel level NUMA node reconfiguration thing uh, due to uh, CPU outplug. But otherwise, you get, so as long as your allocator, so your allocator would have to do that lazily. I mean, uh, you might want to pre-allocate for a, a couple of vCPU IDs, but I mean, keep in mind that you might go beyond if there's a configuration change, so you allocate up to max number of possible CPUs. But then the nice thing is, whenever you hit a virtual CPU that was not used before, then you can do this, uh, well, with RSEC, you both read the virtual CPU number and the NUMA node ID. You use that NUMA node ID to do your NUMA node, uh, your, your memory allocation on this specific NUMA node. And then your NUMA local for, and then you don't need to care about the NUMA node number. For all the following accesses, you just care about the virtual CPU ID and you are accessing NUMA local memory. Yep. Any other questions? Other questions? Nothing on the IRC or uh, it's all good? Let me check. Um, no other questions on Zoom. Oh, wait, Florian has his hand up. Florian, I think it's like a 100 millisecond delay between here and the broadcast. Can you hear me? Oh, my goodness. Yes, we can hear you. Voice yes, of God. Very well, very well. <laughs> OK. Um, do you think we need compiler support for writing restartable sequences? Uh, the implementation side? Yes. Like enhan an enhancement of the flatten attribute, yes. which forcefully tries to inline all called functions into the same function so that you have a contiguous instruction sequence required by RSEC, something like that. Uh, I'll ask Carlos to just r repeat because I mean with the it's very loud with the speaker So if you repeat this question, I'll be able to answer it very so, um, Florian is asking about something that we've been talking about all morning actually leading up to your restartable sequences talk um, and the, the question is Do we want compiler support for writing the restartable sequences? I'd love and, that and <laughs> Florian's comment is specifically about like you uh, mark the function in such a way that the compiler brings everything into the function so that there are no like external calls in that function. That function is basically the restartable sequence that's either going to get executed accessing vCPU data quickly, sorry, per CPU data quickly, or it's not, right? Yeah. And then there's a restart. So. It should also warn if there are side effects before the end and yes. things like that. So the, it can get complex though. I, absolutely, because the restartable sequences look a lot like software transactional memory, which, um, Ray, which Aldi raised a question and said, we should go talk to Richard Henderson, who'd written libitm, and have a conversation with Richard about what he thinks about these core concepts and how we can expose them in the compiler. Um, so, Florian, did we answer your question, and did we get that right? Yeah, I think so, thanks. <laughs> I'm gonna pass this to Zabos. At some point, there was something about using restartable sequences for asymmetric barrier kind of thing, like... Uh, yes, the RSEC fence. So it's, it's in, it's in the, the membarrier system call. So you can call membarrier and asking to issue a RSEC fence, and it's going to restart all the ongoing RSEC critical section. So I guess that's another thing that we might can use in glibc somewhere. Well, there's, a, there's actually a use case for that. So we discussed uh, earlier, uh, Carlos and I, about the use case of uh, the stack cache. Uh, and that's a, that's a point where you want to be able to uh, free 
the, all the stack caches at program teardown before things like Valgrind uh, actually try to figure out if there's been a memory leak. And there's actually an API that Ellipse exposed to free up those resources. But at this point, you may want to support that, okay, yeah, maybe concurrently there's still a thread running or something doing some allocation. So, but the thing is, uh, in order to do this synchronization, we may want to go from a state where we are fast and we use RSEC to do all the updates on, on local data to a state where, okay, we want to do the heavy stomping and, and iterate on everything from a single thread and just touch every per CPU data. So this flip of mode could be done, and then in the heavy mode, you use, a, a, you use locking, right? But this flip, you know, the way you could protect this flip and make sure that there's nobody in the old mode while you're using locking now is by using RSEC fence. So with the RSEC fence, you could make sure that everyone who was in the old mode who may not have seen this bit being flipped on are going to abort and retry and oh, do the locking. So, so this can be useful for that kind of thing. Yeah, so the, the issue, the concern here, and I think it's a, a concern we've talked with Rich Felker about, which is exit handling during concurrent uh, pre-thread create, and like what's your forward progress guarantees on exit? But in this case, like in glibc, we're, we just tear everything down, and it's like it's your fault if you're trying to make threads in the middle of another thread calling exit. Um, but that's the case where uh, as you're leading down this path, you want to just stop everybody from using restartable sequences, I think in this case, and switch to locking, because then, yeah. I mean, the, the exit's not gonna happen, because I think the Valgrind thread takes over, and it wants to call uh, Libc free, uh, free res, right? So either way, this, that whole transition point, I think, has to happen somewhere during exit, if we're gonna start freeing all the thread resources that we had left over. Other questions? Oh, yeah, there's one, actually. So, yeah, so is it, uh, is, are these vCPUs guaranteed to be a small number, and is yes. it a known small number? So it's fixed the, for the lifetime of the processor? So the maximum value is the number of possible CPUs on the, on the system. So uh, it's uh, the number of configured CPU. From a user space point of view, it's called the number of configured CPU. Uh, yes, uh, Carlos, you want to answer? No? Oh, after, after, sorry. Uh, so, it's, so there's an upper bound to that, right? But let's say you're in a process that is uh, where either uh, SCED uh, set affinity or CPU sets have been used to restrict you to run, let's say, on five CPUs. So the worst case is that you have one thread per run queue running actively, so it's five. So the maximum index number you'll get is four, so zero to four. So it really keeps you compact near zero. And if you're single threaded, it's gonna be zero. Um, Florian just raised online saying, uh, revocation of biased file pointer locks could use this kind of mem barrier too, I think. Uh, and he also notes parenthetically, fopen really should produce a file pointer biased towards the current thread. Mm. So. Okay, so additional use cases. Yeah. Yes, I, <laughs> good. the use good. cases are never ending. So. That's perfect, that's why, uh, that's why I'm here for. Uh, I, yeah. I think I'm excited because as of 235, we have the APIs in place and we'll have, we have kernel support for it and then we can start looking at how to use these operations and, and the performance of them and benchmark them. Great. All right, if there are no, uh, one more question over there. Uh, so, uh, sorry, this is going to be a very basic question. I feel like a lot of people here have a lot of background on this, but um, in my mind, I make an, I don't know if it's correct or not, I make an association of restartable sequences as being having some similarities with uh, transactional memory? Uh, in some memory. way, yes. So, but, yes? So my question is, uh, uh, hardware transaction memory was, was implemented, but uh, was, I don't know, people decided that it wasn't 
uh, worth it. So what is different with restartable sequences that it's now um, uh, worth it to, to do them? So as far as I understand, and I'm no expert in hardware transactional memory, but a uh, few paper I read, I mean, comparing RCU with software transa transactional memory, you ended up with RCU being much faster than uh, HTM. So HTM consumes hardware resources as well, and it is aware of what is happening across the entire system, right? So if you're multi-core, HTM is going to snoop around and check, oh, are there updates on other cores and things like that. For RSEC, it's purely per CPU. We don't care about the other cores, single core at a time, and it's mitigated by the kernel in software, only on preemption, so almost never happens. So the, the, the overhead and the footprint is extremely small, and we're and we're using um, standard loads, loads and stores. So, I mean, a RSEC increment is pretty much storing the, the, the RSEC critical section descriptor pointer. So storing a pointer to the portrait area, ink, and we're done, pretty much. I think there, yeah, there may be a, a load current CPU number and a comparison in some cases, but uh, you, get, you, you get the idea. I mean, it, it's standard instruction on Intel. It takes fractions of a nanosecond, and they are heavily optimized. So it's very hard to do faster than that. Well. I guess I'll just sort of mention that the hardware implementation of hardware transaction memory hasn't met expectations, and, and leave it at that. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I guess the approach there is to try to do something similar, but limit the scope, and and do I mean and redesign the data structures in user space to take I mean to partition them in such a way that we can have the benefits of transactional memory, but in a much more localized fashion. And software and fixable. <laughs> <laughs> Any other, other questions? Oh, Carlos? Um, no, I'm, just, I'm relaying a comment from Florian here. He says, hardware transactional memory is prone to speculation vulnerabilities. RSEC automatically inherits any speculation hardening for user space because, as Matthew says, it's just non-atomic instructions. So I think that's a very good point, that if there are speculation attacks against that, we're just inheriting all the protections that user space already has for the existing set of instructions. Yep. So. Good security story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, no other questions? All right, one, two, three. Okay, thank you.